Okay, welcome everyone. We're gonna get started right here on time. And uh, the panel today, this one is called, Is Philanthropy the Answer to Save Journalism? My name is Indira Lakshmanan. I'm the executive editor at the Pulitzer Center on Crisis Reporting, which is in Washington, D.C. We are a nonprofit news organization that is both a grant seeker, so we get money from foundations and donors for our work, and we're also a grant maker in that we give money to news outlets and individuals, freelancers, staff reporters, and photographers, videographers, et cetera, um, to make great journalism that we partner with them on. Um, so we're sort of unique in that sense of being a grant seeker and a grant maker, and that's why I thought it would be interesting to have this conversation. So let me introduce a really terrific and distinguished panel. Right to my left is Craig Newmark, who many of you know. He's the founder of Craigslist, a passionate proponent of ethics and fairness, and also the promotion of women in journalism. He's the head of Newmark Philanthropies, and he is a generous benefactor on many news initiatives, including this International Journalism Festival, to which he gave a generous um, gift of 250000 to help make all of this possible. So we're all pleased for that. <laughs> and um, sitting next to Craig is Vivian Schiller, who is the CEO of the Civil Foundation, and she'll be able to tell you what that is. And she's a former top news executive at NPR, which is American National Public Radio, CNN, New York Times, and has an incredibly ding distinguished career um, as, an ex as a news executive, and now is in the philanthropy space as well. And sitting to her left, um, is the third panelist who I'm also extremely fond of all these people. This is Alan Rusbridger, who I think a lot of you know too. He's the former Guardian editor-in-chief. Yesterday he had a talk about his new book, Breaking News, The Remaking of Journalism and Why It Matters, and he's now chairman of the Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism at Oxford. And as executive uh, editor-in-chief at The Guardian, he obviously played a large role in um, raising money for The Guardian through foundations and membership and other things. So I think we have three really interesting perspectives here about how philanthropy and journalism can work together hand in hand. So Craig, I want to start with you, since you're the one philanthropist on the panel, and um, please can you describe to us your philanthropic approach when it comes to journalism? What is it that drives you that's your passion and um, you know, advice for those people out there who might be seeking philanthropy, what's your perspective as a donor to journalism? In high school history. Oh. In high school history, I learned that, as I like to say it, a uh, trustworthy press is the immune system of democracy. If we're gonna survive as democracies, as republics, we need to know what's really going on. The people we hire, to tell us what's really going on. Those are journalists and newspaper uh, people and so on. So that's what motivated that, going back uh, actually to, uh, to roughly 1970. Uh, in the US, however, in November of 2016, we had a kind of wake up call. Uh, people of goodwill, journalists, people who wanted to make uh, America survive uh, we had this wake-up call seeing that the press as the immune system of democracy didn't do so well. So it was incumbent upon uh, people like me uh, who had some resources to stand up. And like we say in New Jersey, I had to put my money where my mouth is. And that's the uh, gist of things. Generally speaking, my philanthropic approach is, you know, instead of accumulating a lot of cash and then giving it, give it out a little bit at a time, I would accumulate some and then give it out in the here and now to help problems in the here and now while also considering problems of the here and now through the next 200 years. And part of what you've really focused on, um, I was lucky enough to be the first Newmark Chair in Journalism Ethics at the Pointer Institute. One of the things you've really focused on is trustworthy journalism, ethics, um, stopping disinformation. 
so why has that been your number one priority, and what are the initiatives out there that you think are working, that you've well, supported or not? Well, for us as uh, regular people, to make good decisions in a democracy, in a republic, we need good and accurate information, information that we can uh, trust. And the practice of trustworthy behavior, that's called ethics. And, and I kept hearing from people who know a lot more about this than uh, I do, that perhaps the uh, practice of ethics needed to be helped along a little bit by things like influence, cash, maybe sometimes getting people to talk with each other who, are, who focus on these fields. For a long time, I've been supporting folks at the Poynter Institute, which in the US is kind of the pointy end of the spear when it comes to journalistic ethics. I've worked with Indira there. I've gotten good advice from other people about this, including uh, Vivian. And I've read a lot about how it's practiced in the UK via reading, recently reading Alan's book. This is to remind people again, I'm an outsider. I've never really written seriously the deadline. I've never been inside of a newsroom for more than five minutes. So I don't know a lot. But I will listen to people. I listen to my high school history teacher, Mr. Anton Shulsky. Uh, he died recently, and I need to do something in his memory. Um, the ideas that I've learned from folks, and I'm trying to act on that. Um, Vivian, you have worked both at the upper echelons of both for-profit and non-profit news organizations. Now you're running a foundation attached to a for-profit media company. So tell us, with that perspective in mind, some news organizations are now looking to change their model from for-profit to not-for-profit, or a lot of new startups, especially in the local news space, in the United States at least, are sort of starting in as non-profits when they have the choice to do either. What's, what's your perspective on this? What do people need to keep in mind? Yeah, it's been interesting to watch the development of the decision around uh, being a non a not-for-profit or for-profit for evolve over the years. By the way, before I go on, because uh, Craig was speaking so eloquently about ethics, I feel like I should disclose in the spirit of ethics that I'm also an advisor to Craig in addition to everything I do. I just <laughs> wanted to put that out there. Um, but yeah, coming back to your question, you know, I was, at, um, I was the CEO of, of NPR National Public Radio um, about 10 years ago, and, and public radio is, uh, public radio stations are not-for-profit organizations, uh, and uh, public radio has evolved over the years, had evolved into <coughs> quite an effective, uh, quite an effective strategy to funding itself through a variety of diversified revenue streams. And as really, as news organizations began to struggle in the, in the early part of, it, uh, starting in the last decade, uh, there was a, a somehow a, a, a misunderstanding that by declaring yourself a not-for-profit, if you are for-profit, that uh, all of a sudden, all the hard work of having to uh, uh, bring in revenue would magically disappear. It was almost laughable. I saw the discussion going, well, you know, NPR doesn't have to make money, right? I mean, they're a not-for-profit, so w w why don't we do that too? It's, it obviously completely defies logic. You cannot, if you're going to spend money on journalism, you need to bring money in to, in order to uh, fund that journalism, irrespective of whether you are, uh, a, have a not-for-profit status or whether you are beholden to shareholders or, or what have you. So um, there was a period of sort of a great deal of confusion about what it means to be a not-for-profit. And at the end of the day, there's really not that much of a difference uh, uh, between a very ethically-minded, public service-oriented for-profit local news organization and not-for-profit not local news organization. Honestly, a lot of the tactics are the same. A lot of the, um, the, the, the revenue streams that, that, are, that are people are experimenting with are the same. It really doesn't have that much of a difference. Um, that said, more and more, particularly in the US, uh, new news organizations that are coming into, into, into being to try to fill uh, holes left by uh, the collapse of many newspapers are not-for-profits. 
um, they feel that that is more um, aligned with their mission, and some of them have seen some, some great success, uh, like the Texas Tribune in particular, uh, in, in Texas, which is a very, very successful not-for-profit and many other small news organizations coming online now. Well, Vivian, you also, you know, you talk about mission here, and I think that that's what draws a lot of journalists to nonprofit news organizations. I started my career at NPR and, um, you know, have worked in public television too, and I really resonate with that because it feels like mission, it feels like we're not out for the almighty buck, but of course you're right that nonprofits need to make money too. I wonder in your experience firsthand, at, say, NPR versus CNN, what did you experience as a difference in, a re in the relationship with mm -hmm. audiences at for-profits and non-for-profit well, news? I, I think maybe a closer corollary would be uh, NPR and the New York Times. Okay. Um, which I was also at the, at the New York Times for seven years. And the New York Times is absolutely a for-profit company. It is a publicly traded company. It has shareholders, the whole, the whole thing. And yet, an organization like the New York Times, which is uh, committed to public service journalism, to, uh, to, its, to its readers, and to the highest standards of journalism, really, when you are inside the newsroom of the New York Times, and you're inside the newsroom of NPR, there is no difference. There really, there really isn't. Um, yes, there is a responsibility to provide shareholder value, uh, at the New York Times, which the, which they, after years of struggling, struggling, they're now doing very successfully, but it doesn't it doesn't have to be a difference. That said, there are plenty of for-profit news organizations that are perhaps not quite as civically minded. We're seeing that in certain part in certain newspaper groups or the owners of certain newspaper groups who are uh, cutting to the bone of the staffs of uh, their their local newspapers. Um, uh, reaping great rewards for themselves and their shareholders, uh, while not particularly serving uh, the communities that, that they that they are intended to serve. So, Alan, when you worked at the Guardian for I think some twenty years, you had the benefit that the Guardian is run by the Scott Trust. Um, but you also were a pioneer in bringing in other sources of funding from foundations, from members, et cetera. So I wonder, is this, you know, it, it feels as if philanthropy <coughs> needs to be a way of financing certain kinds of reporting that may not have market solutions. What are your thoughts on that? Well, the, Guard the Guardian, for those of you who don't know, it is owned by a trust, and uh, it's coming up to... 200 years old, and uh, I read somewhere this week that the chances of a company lasting 200 years are like one in a billion. I mean, it, it, it almost <laughs> never happens. So th this funny little paper, which was never run for profit, is doing something right. Uh, and it, it, the, the owners uh, of the, the Guardian, the, the Scott family, actually gave it away in the 1930s. Where they, they could have sold it for a lot of money, but, but their motive in, in publishing the Guardian was different. And I think that communicates itself to the readers who realize that, that no one's in The Guardian to get money, to make money or, or to make huge profits. And so when we launched the membership scheme of The Guardian, which is essentially a philanthropic model, it, it's saying, will you give money to The Guardian not so that you can have a private good that no one else can read, but to make this a public good that everyone else can read? That's a, that's a philanthropic thing. <coughs> because people think... Someone's popping corks of champagne. They're so excited <laughs> about your idea. See? Let's all celebrate. Bring some up here, too. <laughs> it's Prosecco o'clock. <laughs> Go ahead, Helen. I'll, I'll have some of what she's having. Yes. <laughs> so it, it's essentially a philanthropic model because this, but th these are a million readers now who think that the, the, the kind of journalism that the, the Guardian does is necessary in a society and they want more people to be uh, uh, made available. But as Indira said, there, there were other forms of, of um, uh, philanthropic giving that we uh, took. So I'll give you two examples. One is we had a very large grant from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to do development reporting. So that's reporting mainly but not exclusively in the, the continent of Africa that we would simply not be able to uh, afford if we, uh, if we didn't have that kind of backing. 
uh, and I see nothing but good in taking that kind of money to do that kind of reporting. Uh, and the second example was uh, I had a phone call one day from an Australian politician saying, would you please come and open The Guardian in Australia? Because 70% of the Australian press is, open, is, is, is owned by Rupert Murdoch. Uh, and a woman called Gina Reinhardt, one of the, a billionaire iron ore owner, is about to buy the only bit, the Fairfax Group, that isn't owned by Murdoch, and we have a crisis. And I said, well, that's a lovely idea, but we simply don't have the money. Uh, and he said, well, what if a philanthropist came forward? Um, so in the end, there was a man called Graham Wood, who'd made a lot of money out of a, of a website called What If? Uh, and Graham gave us about 15 million pounds um, to start up a website, a, a, an operation in Australia. And the deal was if we ever managed to make a profit out of Australia, we would have to pay him back. Uh, and that was a fantastic thing for him to do. Uh, the Australian operation, I'm sorry to say, is now profit making. <laughs> uh, so the Guardian has now got to pay the guy back. Um, uh, but that was good, I think, for Australian democracy. It employed lots of journalists, has done fantastic reporting. And so there are these models which The Guardian has pioneered, but it starts you know, with, with an organization in which nobody is, is, is there to make large sums of money. Well, just to follow up to that, I know that The Guardian has experimented with a lot of different kinds of projects and models. Um, not all of them have been successful. Mm -hmm. Um, why don't you tell us about which were the biggest successes in your view and those that were failures, why did they not work? Well, I, I think, um, I, 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 mean, I, I mean, lots of examples. We did, we did a thing on, on modern slavery um, and uh, that led us to the building of the stadiums in, in Qatar um, and that was a story that went around the world. Um, now that, that was using money that had been given to us by people who were interested in modern slavery. Um, if you go to the Guardian website, there's a large section of it devoted to um, urban development, how, how you create good cities. Uh, uh, and again, that is money that this is reporting that the Guardian would not be able to afford, except that somebody has come forward. Uh, and I, I think we get a lot out of that. and. Um, and the, the people who give us the money obviously think they're, they're getting a, a, a good deal out of that. Um, my mind has gone blank as to failures. I'm the, 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 the will, Convenient. The, the will have, the will have been failures. <laughs> have been. All right, I'll let you think about that. I'll give you a pass this time on the next round. I expect an answer on that. Um, so, you know, that's interesting that you say about people coming forward and giving money for issues they're specifically interested in. And I can say at the Pulitzer Center, we also have that in that certain donors have said, hey, I'm really interested in land rights or um, for police profit, uh, for profit policing. And I'm thinking of Omidyar. And, um, and so we said, great, those are issues we're interested in. It didn't make us do it because he gave us the money for it. It was something we were already interested in doing. But giving us that money enabled us to spark and support projects cross newsroom collaboration at places like the Kentucky Center for Investigative Reporting, Texas Tribune, which... Um, Vivian mentioned, mentioned uh, St. Louis Public Radio, and do this sort of big, you know, cross trans or across the USA project that's been data driven because this donor was interested in it. Well, as it turned out, we're very gratified because the Supreme Court had a ruling about two months ago that was against civil asset forfeiture, against this kind of for-profit policing, and we feel as if, you know, the sort of collective reporting that we spurred through the Midwest, the South, and across the country um, played a role in that. So I think that sometimes there's some kind of taboo um, against um, news organizations taking money for a certain issue, but if it's an issue that they are already committed to and want to report on anyway, it's not like somebody said, hey, we want you to report on jelly beans, and then we had to go around and find a bunch of stories to do on jelly beans. It was something that fit with our mission. Um, so, you know, that's a criticism I've heard before in philanthropy, that philanthropists are putting their thumb on the scale. But I think it's up to the news organization if that's something like modern slavery, like urban, the future of cities, um, like for-profit policing that you care about and want to report on. Um, I personally don't see an issue with that. So, Craig, 
I have to ask you about one of the most interesting books that I've been dipping into and reading lately and have really enjoyed some of the commentary from Anand and I'm going to unfortunately probably mess up his name. Jared (laughs) Haradas? Yeah, thank you. Okay, Um, which is called Winners Take All. And in it, he does criticize philanthropy, um, and his principal argument is that it's a way for the rich to maintain the status quo, to feel good about themselves, that they're giving away some money for good causes, but actually they're keeping... Um, the system in place as it is. What's your response to that? He has a really good point, amplified by recent observations, that a lot of the people who signed up for the uh, billionaire pledges um, aren't really following through. They're giving away small amounts of money which over the course of decades might fulfill those pledges and then might, uh, not, uh, might not be doing so. In my simple-minded, uh, nerdly way, I've just decided to uh, start giving it away all during my uh, lifetime, um, and I've gone uh, considerable length in that direction. The deal is that I do see uh, the U.S. and the world uh, in crisis. People who've been uh, lucky enough to do well need to, as some say, send the elevator back down to help out people who need a hand in the here and now, so that's been my focus. Specifically when it comes to funding journalism operations, I start with some of the ethical principles propagated only in the last year and a half by the American uh, Press Institute, basically saying that the default position should be uh, unrestricted funding. Uh, So that's my normal model. Some of the exceptions are that like anyone, like any citizen can, uh, any citizen can stand up and tell a philanthropic uh, grantee of funding. They can say, "Hey, practice good uh, journalistic ethics." Um, they can go ahead and say things like, you know, anyone can say, uh, perhaps um, focus in certain areas. You can't, as a uh, as a grantor. I cannot say anything like show me or give me pre-publication access. And for the most part, I can't even say uh, please do the following because it'll be really funny. <laughs> although, although I have Yeah, whatever point- happened to that penguin logo you were going to use <laughs> oh, for no. <laughs> Newmark Philanthropies? That was funny. Well, the <laughs> logo that I, something I proposed for the, uh, for the CUNY School of Journalism since it's uh, named after me, Uh, In the U.S., a lot of people know that there was a long-running TV show. One of the characters was a stunningly handsome man, a character named George Costanza, (laughs) played by Jason Alexander. And I've requested that the picture of me there be actually one of Jason Alexander (laughs) playing George Costanza. I don't know if that's been successful. Uh, Monday Monday was April 1st. And they could so have changed I'm, uh, it for the day. Like so I'm just. hoping uh, <laughs> something like that happened. Oh, and uh, one of the uh, <laughs> some of the swag handed out uh, by the university um, is uh, one of these. Most of you are too young to recognize this is a plastic pocket protector. <laughs> this, as a nerd growing up in the 50s, this uh, let's see, this is what I wore in high school as well as thick black glasses taped together. You don't even have a pocket. <laughs> no social skills, although I can simulate them now. That is, any, anything that looks like social skills, I am faking right now. <laughs> but in my teens, wearing one of these was uh, an excellent form of uh, repelling romantic interests. <laughs> well, you've since married a lovely wife, Eileen, so I think it all worked out. Yeah. Um, so, you, go the, ahead, I'm sorry. Yeah. Again, the deal, is that, the deal is that default position, no restrictions on what kind of reporting is done, uh, but like any citizen, I can suggest that the organization practice good journalistic ethics. I can suggest strongly that they practice really good communications and PR, And I can suggest that any grantee work with other people, other grantees doing similar work, 
most importantly, I keep telling uh, journalism organizations to protect their people and to work with other organizations to protect each other's people because journalists are at risk throughout the world. And I know a lot of organizations in the US are not protecting people like they should be, both physically and uh, informationally. One thing that you have done as a donor, and I think this is really important for other potential donors and foundations in the room to hear um, from my position as someone who seeks grants, is that your default is to give unrestricted grants to cover the costs of projects and operations. And I think what's good about this is that you untie the hands of journalism organizations in that they can use that money where they see the biggest need, as opposed to having to niche it to some specific thing. So tell us, how do you decide who to give money to? Uh, I'm, a, I'm an amateur at this, I'm a, but I'm a talented amateur. I have uh, lots of people to talk to who know the business. I have a pretty firm idea of what's, uh, of what's needed, at least in the US. Importantly, I have some idea of what the news business is like in the U.S., maybe a little bit in the U.K., but otherwise my ignorance is vast. So I've been learning this somewhat intensively for 12 years, even before I knew I was learning things. And then I can rely on folks like uh, Vivian. Uh, there's Jeff Jarvis in the uh, audience there. Uh, Sally Lehrman is around here someplace. There's a lot of people I can talk to to fill in the gaps of my knowledge. The only, uh, the only disappointment I've had is that none of the experts I've been able to talk to in journalism are funnier than I am. <laughs> um, so That's a low standard. Yeah. I think Vivian's pretty funny, and she's one of your uh, chief advisors. I think she's pretty funny. So um, Vivian, though, on a serious note, um, <laughs> I'm not going to try to be funny. <laughs> so I, I have a question about how, um, you know, the notion, at least in the United States and in many countries in Europe, has shifted that journalism is not just about budgets are being cut and, oh, my gosh, we're all going to lose our jobs and we're not going to be able to cover important stories anymore. It's not just that. It's now being framed as there's a threat to democracy if journalism goes down the tubes. So there are some funders who've sort of come out of the woodwork recently supporting journalism because they really want it as a, it's a proxy for supporting democracy. So is that some place where you see philanthropy able to fill a gap? Is that the way we should be framing our asks? Because I just heard yeah. at another panel someone saying, don't frame it as we poor journalists, sad, we're all going to lose no, our jobs. Right. Frame it as what's your mission. I, I would actually frame it in a slightly different way. But before I have yet another disclosure, I, would, <laughs> I, would, I could just keep going with these disclosures, which is I'm a member of the Scott Trust, which, uh, which Alan mentioned, which oversees the guard. So I just feel like I have to get all these disclosures relative to the other panelists out there. And my last disclosure is I'm very good friends with Indira and love hanging out with her. Um, so uh, I actually think, I mean, this is one of the great ironies of our time, right, which is um, that the fact that they're the threat to um, independent... Uh, fact-based, evidence-based journalism um, is under assault around the world and is uh, under assault really in a, in a big way, in a meaningful way in the United States. Um, in, in, as, as horrific as it is to be called by the President of the United States enemy of the people and all kinds of other terrible names, um, the, 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 the irony is it has galvanized um, many Americans, I'm speaking just about America, I know this is the case in other parts of the world, towards wanting to preserve journalism. But I agree, it is not, it should, ne it should never be framed, oh, poor journalists are losing their jobs, make sure they can put food on the table, all, all of which, by the way, is true. It's not about the journalists, it's about the public. And I, I, I sometimes fear that that messaging gets lost. This is about making sure the journalists are, we are merely the vessels <laughs> through whom we can, we ensure that, again, let me just speak about the United States, that democracy is preserved by making sure that the public has the information they need to participate in that democracy, to take part in their society. That's what this is about. So when people, when, when we talk about the fact that um, 
the White House has stopped doing press conferences, for example. You know, it's not about boo-hoo the poor journalists, it's boo-hoo the poor citizens of the United States mm -hmm. who are not getting this information. You know, that's why there is, I'm a little a bit of a soapbox here, but you know, that's why this lawsuit around um, Trump dr blocking people on Twitter is so important. A lot of people are saying, oh, who cares if he blocks you on Twitter, what's the difference? At this moment, that is the main vehicle, communication vehicle for information from the President of the United States to the public. Anyway, so to me, that is, uh, that is what the, the, the mission and, and the pitch, if you will, to philanthropists is and should be. And again, the good news in, in a dark time is that more and more, more and more individuals, high net worth individuals, are stepping up because they see that risk and they want to fund that good work. Craig is one example. Others, an, another example is, for instance, uh, Lorene Powell Jobs through the Emerson Collective. They have substantially stepped up in their giving. Um, there are uh, lots and lots of new initiatives that are, that are, coming, um, that are coming into existence uh, in the United States, getting a lot of funding from philanthropists and from individuals like Report for America, which is sending report, I'm on their board too, which, which sends reports, sorry, which sends out, it's a not-for-profit though, I don't get paid, sends, which sends out reporters into, into communities, or the American Journalism Project, which Craig was one of the funders of, which is going to try to replicate the success of Texas Tribune in other parts of the United States. So to me, that's what uh, we should, we should the, sort of the focus the, the education and the pitch to philanthropists should be. I just wanted to comment on one other thing. Jerry, you talk, we, we were talking about generals. Of course, anyone that wants to give money, general support is always, always the best way to go because news organizations need to pay their rent as well as you know, put, send reporters out on great projects. I'm not sure I completely agree about the notion of uh, funders suggesting reporting lines, even if it's worthy reporting lines. Mm -hmm. I actually, I don't we, we can debate this debate this later if you want to, but mm -hmm. actually I have a slightly different view. I'll just put that out there. And say no, I, and I, I also have many thoughts on this, yeah. so I, I, I take that and I appreciate it. I do know that restricted grants, though, are often the way that yeah. many funders prefer yes. to give, and they restrict it to certain topic areas. No, that's not my preference. Um, but it would be if it's something that you're already reporting on Absolutely. anyway, then it's a little different. I should disclose that in my work with uh, New York City-based uh, newspapers and other reporting means, we'll see New York City actually has become a news desert, uh, which is uh, terribly ironic, and I'm trying to encourage them, some of the people I'm supporting, like Gothamist and the city, to establish a celebrity vermin beat. <laughs> because in New York, there are things like Pizza Rat. Uh, yesterday, we heard reports about the 14th Street and 6th Avenue raccoon. Um, this, again, this literally uh, happened yesterday, and I'm very fond of raccoons. And the uh, six-year-old <laughs> girl who lives uh, above me felt very sorry for the raccoon. So I, I have suggested uh, increased coverage. Well, that's community uh, news, right? Yes. It's one kind of community news. Uh, On coyotes. Let's not forget about coyotes coming into New York. <laughs> um, you know, Vivian, to your point about it's which I agree with, that it's certainly not about the journalists. It's about us as the vessel and vehicle for being the eyes and ears um, for the public. But it's not trivial, the amount of job loss, certainly in the United yeah. States, and I think people often overlook this. Since the year 2000, there have been more jobs lost in newspapers than in coal mining, fisheries, and the steel industry combined. So when our president is constantly saying, oh my gosh, the poor miners and the poor steel workers, well actually we've lost more jobs than they have. And American newspapers are still shedding jobs at a rate of 1,000 per month and on average. Um, Alan, I wanna ask you in, you know, you mentioned the example of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and that Australian philanthropist. Did you ever face up against conflicts of interest? Were there certain things that you guys had to report on? Like imagine you, um, your development reporter is doing a piece on which philanthropies are actually successful and which are not. And what if they came up with a story saying, you know, Gates is ineffective? What would you do at that point? 
and you know, how did you have firewalls to protect you from conflicts of interest with funders and stories? Well, I think you have to have two rules. One, one, one is, the first is you have to have rules. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> so you have to clearly work out what the rules are uh, in advance so that, so that you're not stumbling into arguments later. And that the second is you have to have transparency. So you have to publish those rules and, and m make sure everybody understands the terms of trade and you have to flag the pieces so that people can see how this is paid for uh, and they can go and look at the rules. So everything is transparent and rule bound. Well, I think once you've done that, it, I mean, the, as mo you know, most journalist organizations, most newspapers take money from oil companies and from car companies and from banks in forms of advertising. Uh, and the story we tell the public, uh, and which I certainly believed in the 20 years I was editing, is that that, that would never influence you. There is a, a complete separation between the advertising and the editorial. Now, there are examples, regrettably, uh, where those, those, those barriers have broken down and there's a sort of meta-argument about, uh, uh, about the, 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 um, the, the framing of, of um, a sort of capitalist narrative, but, but nevertheless, as journalists, we should be robust enough to, uh, to have a complete separation between advertising and uh, editorial. And if we could do it for that, why can't we do it for philanthropy? You know, why, why, why do suddenly our standards weaken because Bill Gates is giving us the money as opposed to Shell or Audi or Volvo or BMW? Um, so I, I don't think it should be a problem. As I say, if you have the rules and if you're transparent about them and everything is clearly labeled. Have you thought of any experiments that The Guardian <laughs> did that weren't as successful as you would have liked? I'm not trying to put you on the spot, yeah. but for this audience, I think a lot of people here are thinking about how to take money, when and if to take philanthropy, and it would be useful, I think, to hear what are the more successful models and what are the ones that well, maybe didn't I was, work. I, I was racking my brain, and I, actually, I think the, the strictly philanthropic models, I felt... <laughs> Fine about you know we we were we would we were only taking it in pursuit of of uh, reporting that we would have liked to have done anyway um, and that we believed in that the stuff that I felt uneasy about was was so-called native advertising mm -hmm. um, in which so at one point we had a, a very large corporation who wanted to be good and to do good and to be thought well of, who gave us money to write about perfectly decent things. Um, but it was always there in the background that that, that was... Paid content. Yeah. And wait, wait, wait. So they were having Guardian reporters do it, as opposed to having outside people they, they, whose that, that bylines they, looked they want, like reporters? Yeah. And we, and we, we did it, and... Uh, I felt always a bit uneasy about it. And of course, there always comes a moment when somebody on your staff deliberately decides to have a massive go at this company, uh, almost <laughs> to, uh, to, to test, you know, yeah. okay, the editor's very good at speaking on panels about this kind of stuff, but what about if I write a column that is absolutely 100% targeted at saying this company is evil? Um, and of course that happened. Uh, did, um, and did it publish? <laughs> did the yeah, column yeah, get published? Of course published? we had to, had to publish it. Um, uh, I mean, I rang him up and questioned his motives, you know, why, can I just ask why you're writing this? And he said, well, I just believe this company is awful. Uh, and, um, uh, and I'm horrified that we're taking money from it. So, but, you know, we published it. And w when we did our Keep It in the Ground campaign, which was a about climate change, uh, and it was slightly, w what we were trying to do was to target the good guys. We thought there's no point in trying to get divestment from fossil fuels, from big banks, um, they're not going to listen. But if we go to the good guys, it's the peril of being a liberal, that p people will always be horrible to liberals because we, we might change our minds. Um, and so we targeted the Wellcome Foundation, wonderful medical foundation, and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, uh, and said, we don't get it. You know, your, you, your mission is to go out and... and um, solve the, the, the health problems of the world, and yet you've got hundreds of millions of pounds invested in the biggest killer 
in, in, in fossil fuels. There's a sort of mismatch there, and we, we ask you to divest. Um, and we were fairly aggressive in targeting the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and we got all our readers to write personal letters to Bill Gates, and I'm sure he was absolutely sick of us doing that. Um, but we, we, we didn't hold back because we thought, well, we mustn't upset Bill Gates because he gives us money. We, we full-throatedly targeted him. Interesting. All right, I'm going to ask you all a quick lightning round of questions before we go to the audience. So, folks, please be thinking of the questions that you're going to want to ask. Um, so, Craig, I want to ask you, what is the end game of philanthropy and journalism? Where do you see this ending up? I mean, what is it that you want to achieve through your philanthropic giving? And is there ever going to be a time when journalism can wean itself off of philanthropy? Well, or are we just in a world where because of the internet and the death of print advertising that, you know, we're well, doomed? I <laughs> want to be able to pick up a uh, newspaper in some form, digital or otherwise, and to be able to trust it. Um, that's especially true of Wikipedia, where facts go to live, but that is the new normal to which I'm uh, dedicated. Um, and I'll, it may, I may not live to see it since I'm in my final years. <laughs> um, <Right. laughs> I think that's a bit of an exaggeration, but oh, yeah. okay. <laughs> but that's the uh, target. All right. Um, Vivian, I want to ask you what you see as the most effective model for applying for grants. And I know you have said that collaborative projects are really, yes. you know, people like to see news organizations or new, you know, news philanthropies working together. What is, is that the way of the yeah. future? Well, is yeah, you just answered effective? it actually. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Please elaborate. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I, yeah. Uh, I, don't I mean, in my experience on various uh, sides of the giving, getting, um, the most effective, uh, what the, uh, uh, many of the most effective strategies are about collaboration between organizations, particularly, Craig spoke about this too, but I've seen it uh, throughout uh, philanthropy, which is um, good organizations not uh, working with each other to amplify their uh, their their, their effectiveness. And the interesting thing is what, what I, I learned um, in the process was sometimes a, an organization would say, well, I don't want um, to do a joint grant or a joint uh, you know, pitch proposal with uh, my competitor across town because you know, it's either you know, him, or, him or me. But actually, for many philanthropists, the opposite is true, um, which is uh, if two even competing, say, local news organizations have a collaborative proposal, many, most philanthropists that I have encountered will reward that behavior by uh, making the, 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 the sum of the two, you know, the, the, by giving more than, uh, that each organization ends up with a, a, a larger grant than they would if they, if they went it alone. And this is one of the effective levers, I think, levers for good, positive change, that philanthropists can make, which is to try to encourage this kind of uh, collaboration where it's appropriate. Um, I'll say from the end of someone who gets foundation money and donor money to do our work, um, we have then sparked collaborations between different newsrooms, as I said, for that for-profit policing. We have more than half a dozen newsrooms signed up for that, and that's been really exciting um, to see them work together. And we've also sparked collaborations between radio, TV, and print or digital in the same city. As you say, people who would typically be um, competitors, but are actually quite pleased in the end to work together because their work gets amplified. So, you know, w although we're not philanthropists, we are grant makers, and we definitely take that into consideration. Um, Alan, I want to ask you, is membership, you know, the sort of w the form that The Guardian, I think, really pioneered, is that a form of philanthropy too? I mean, it may be individual readers giving $5 or $10, but should we consider that philanthropy? I, th I think it absolutely is, um, and I think journalism is going to have to think about how it reframes itself, as I said this a bit yesterday, as, as, as a public service. I mean, it, 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 except in 
a, a handful of, of journalistic organizations, it, it's not going to be about making money in future. Those, those days are gone. Uh, but nevertheless, the world needs journalists, I think. Uh, uh, and the more information chaos we see around us, uh, it should be more easy to make the case that uh, the world needs journalism and that, and that is a public service and, de and deserves support. And so I would think that in future, we will see um, more bids by news companies to become 501c3s or charities or to uh, mimic the kind of work that NGOs are doing, uh, to think of, to present themselves as research organizations or even education organizations. Uh, I think there will be new forms of companies that are, are about mission and about social enterprise rather than about profit. Uh, so I think there's going to be a big shift in this kind of direction over the next 10 years. All right. We'll be watching. All right. Do, can I see hands of people who'd like to ask questions? All right. I'm going to take them three at a time, and I'll make notes so that we can keep track of them. Is there a microphone where um, I saw Josh's hand in the back go up first? Um, right yes. Now. So, Could you identify yourself, Josh? Yeah, Josh Meyer. I'm an independent reporter, but I've worked at the LA Times, NBC News, Politico, et cetera. Um, the question is, I, I've been a student uh, of investigative reporting for a long time, and the, and the um, evolution or changes of it from the muckrakers of the turn of the 20th century through the, you know, the false balance years, and I'm not sure where we've ended up now. But my question is, uh, you know, you've talked about reporting lines. Uh, you know, journalists are the eyes and ears for the public. Alan, you talked about somebody who decided to really have a massive go at a company. So my question is for, for philanthropy, um, is there a line there you know, between being the eyes and ears of, a, uh, of the public and really having a go at corrupt institutions and despotic regimes? I mean, is there a place, do you, or what, what's your take on So are you asking us if there's a distinction between watchdog journalism and public service journalism, well, what, is that what you mean? I, I'm interested to get all your thoughts on on something that goes a little bit maybe beyond watchdog journalism and really is uh, aggressively trying to expose corrupt multinational corporations, okay. uh, despotic regimes. I mean, it, it's kind of an aggressive form of reporting that I think may be off-putting to some people that they think you have an agenda. But in earlier times, it was considered necessary for democracy to go after Standard Oil and things like that. So just wondering if there's a if that's a reporting line and where does that line uh, stop for you. Okay, let's take the next question. Um, I'll let the woman with the microphone. <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, hi, thanks a lot. I'm uh, Alexander Fanta. I'm a journalist and uh, um, we recently looked a bit into how Google and Facebook are funding journalism. Do you uh, work for a particular publication? Uh, yes, yeah, it's called uh, Netzpolitik.org. It's a German news website and we okay. collaborated with others and we, pre we actually presented our findings yesterday okay. at a panel. And so we, are, we looked into how especially Google is financing journalism and we all know this because this festival is um, funded by Google. And they have never really called their journalism funding philanthropy because I assume it is quite closely tied with their business interest. And for me, the question is, how, what does that mean for you know, news organizations to accept money that is in some way tied to the business interest um, of, of the funder? And what, you know, what does the panel think on that? And what, what, how, what, what kind of ethical dilemmas does that offer for Good. journalism? Thank you. And let's take a third question. Is there a lady there with her hand up? Hello. Oh, oh, which lady? You go. This no, you're the lady I saw. I'm the lady. Yes, okay. you're the. They're both ladies. More than but one. You're lady. the lady I saw. Um, hi, thank you. My name is Eliza Anyangwe. Um, I uh, started my own platform focusing on African women's stories, but I used to be at the Guardian, and I pay rent by working at the Bureau of Investigative Journalism. Um, I guess a comment first, which is. It's really interesting how normalized it is now to talk about philanthropy in legacy newsrooms, um, but you haven't talked at all about the cultural aspect of it, which is um, those of us who were working, for example, at The Guardian when um, philanthropy funding started to be taken, we're 
often not seen as journalists. Mm -hmm. um, there was this question of, are you in commercial? Are you journalists? Um, and I think for lots of newsrooms that are going to follow in this path, um, that might have changed because awards are being won. Um, but there is definitely a culture element to, to be done alongside um, sort of just taking the money. Um, and to the point that you made about um, uh, it, I, my project benefits from uh, EJC funding to tell development stories, but I often see that the interest is sort of uh, down the river, if you like, in the lives of people who are, be um, are suffering from the harms of the system, and I find there is less interest in reporting about the people who are causing those harms, um, and so uh, philanthropic funding doesn't often um, support that kind of work. And then finally, sorry guys. Um, oh my gosh, it's three I know, pronged. I know, but yeah, there's three like of a White you, House so press, one for each press of you. office here. <laughs> press room here, just three dividing question. them up evenly. <laughs> um, um, I guess the last question is just this question of um, the struggles and sort of legacy with advertising going away should have opened up a more even playing field, which means that philanthropic funding can go to anyone with good stories, anyone with good ideas, and yet we find that it's that funding isn't raising all boats, right? So the things that legacy newsrooms are doing badly, they, those gaps continue to exist because they continue to suck up the money for philanthropy. Okay. Um, and so how do we redress that balance? Thank you for your comments as well as your questions. All right, so first Josh Meyer, um, and just Josh as an aside, when I was doing trust work and trust research at Pointer and ethics work, I found that the word, using the word watchdog was not as popular with news audiences and news consumers. They preferred the word guard dog because watchdog <laughs> seemed too aggressive, like Arr! right? Where guard dog is like a nice, you know, guard dog, your, your boxer named Goofsy who's taking care of the family. So so that's just an aside. Who would like to answer Josh's question about how aggressive, um, you know, journalism, investigative journalism can or should be in the context of philanthropic funding? Well, I mean, there, there are models, aren't they? I mean, the, the, the intercept, you can, you can love or loathe, but, but that was more or less set up to do exactly what you're suggesting um, and uh, uh, being funded by a very rich man, Pierre Omidia. Um, who specifically wants to do the kind of critiquing of, of um, those forces of power. The ProPublica does it in America, the Bureau of Investigative Journalism we've heard about in, in London. So uh, I think obviously there is a danger that, 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 that people who've made a lot of money may not want to critique the system that, that, that out of which they made their money, but I think there are examples of, of the opposite. Um, ICIJ to, too. ICIJ, you yeah, know. Yeah. No, the, yeah. yeah. So he's saying he's interested in where your lines are. Obviously, you did publish well, that I mean, column by your columnist, despite it. Yeah, I mean, as, 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 uh, that was an example of, of, of a, a moment where the, where the two clashed. And you know, as an editor, <laughs> of course, you, you published the column. And if, if I hadn't published the column, uh, I wouldn't be sitting here with clean hands talking about it today. But, but you know, hopefully any editor worth their salt would do what I did. And did you want to add on either of the other questions? Yeah. Um, I mean, Facebook and Google is, is a very good question, a very good risk. Yeah, I mean, it's very real risk, and, and that they are being, they're spending so much money at the moment uh, supporting journalism, which we like them for, don't we? Um, but, but it obviously <laughs> comes with risks. Why, why are they doing this, and are they buying our silence? And I was on a panel yesterday when James Bull was criticizing the, the quality of, the, 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 of, of how we as journalists hold them to account. So um, uh, I think if we're going to take their money, we should certainly feel free to criticize them. But let's do it in a, in a really sophisticated and, and meant way. Um, then the, the, oh, before we go on to the next right, question, okay. I think Vivian okay. has no, some comments on No, I want to just talk about this. Google. Actually, I mean, I think, uh, yes, look, it's the, the question of money from from Google and Facebook is a really difficult one. Um, you know, on, uh, on the, I mean, it's so much money and so much good can be done with that money. It seems almost uh, irresponsible not to take it. And, and of course, you know, in theory, it all comes with, you know, they, they, they will, all, all of the written stipulations say that they have no editorial control, of course, of course. That said, you know, appearance of impropriety or just that sort of soft influence is absolutely a risk, which is why we see many organizations now saying we will not take money 
from Google or Facebook. But, but I think that the, the, the remedy to that is exactly what Alan brought up, which is more reporting on tech companies. And actually, I think that is happening. I see across the board much more aggressive uh, reporting about all tech companies um, by a lot of the mainstream media. In fact, I'll do a, a slight commercial that at noon, uh, just after this panel down the hill on the square, Julia Engwin is going to be speaking. She is, with funding from, from Craig, uh, launching a, uh, a, a news organization called The Markup that is going to be exclusively focused on reporting on the intersection of technology and society. And um, she, she and her reporting partner um, and, and the other reporters here have done excellent work in that regard at the Wall Street Journal, at ProPublica, and elsewhere. So I think as long as we keep, we, the collective we, keep reporting, I think we can try to find a balance there. Um, to the best of my understanding, with a regular conventional legacy newspaper, there is a wall between advertising and editorial, sometimes compromised, uh, but generally uh, maintained at newspapers like the New York Times and Washington Post. Similarly, at those institutions where Google or Facebook provide some funding, as far as I could tell, walls have been preserved which uh, maintain that kind of distance. There's a lot of problems to be found in uh, journalism. I don't think that's going to be much of a priority uh, problem. Um, I will say uh, the, the Pulitzer Center on Crisis Reporting was given a $5 million gift to our endowment um, a couple of months ago from Facebook. And we are, and we're very happy about it because that endowment gift is going to allow us in perpetuity to continue doing what we're already doing, which is supporting local news organizations to do the highest quality in-depth and enterprise reporting. Facebook has absolutely no say over who we fund or who we support or what projects we're interested in, none. They put, a, they wrote a check, they put it into our endowment and that's that and they're delighted that we're doing that we're helping various local newsrooms and what they have said to me is that part of their model has been to fund intermediaries like we're an intermediary like report for America is an intermediary organization that supports other newsrooms um, and I think that makes a lot of sense because we're journalists we're editors we know how to pick winners and make projects happen um, as opposed to the New York Times feeling like oh you know we shouldn't be taking money directly from a platform and so I think this is a much better way way of doing it, giving money to intermediaries instead of making newsrooms feel like they're beholden. Um, that's my own take. All right, let's do a quick answer to Eliza's question yeah. about the cultural aspect of philanthropy. And Eliza, I think you're completely right that it's way more acceptable now for newsrooms to take philanthropic funding than when you were working at The Guardian, as you described. And we have an up top credit requirement that I instituted when I took over as executive editor because I said in the interest of, of transparency, um, you know, it's not just tooting our horn, but in transparency, if it runs in the New York Times or the New Yorker or PBS or whatever, it needs to say up top that this project was done with, you know, in partnership with the Pulitzer Center. And in the past, news organizations didn't want to give us up top credit or they even wanted to not give us credit. Now everyone's like, yes. Absolutely, thank you, and where do I sign? And how can we do this project together? So it's gone from, you know, from my predecessor, it was a real problem, and for me, I, I just have insisted upon it, and it hasn't been a problem because there's so much more acceptance. What about, what are your guys' thoughts? Yeah, I, I, I think you're completely right, Eliza. When we, when, when we started taking that um, money, we didn't, we didn't know quite how to place it within the organization, and I, I, I hope those barriers have, have melted away now, because in the end, the, the work has to be as good as anything else that's appearing in The Guardian, otherwise you're going to damage the reputation of The Guardian. And on the, the, the point about um, sucking up, the legacy organization sucking up the money, that, that is a danger. Uh, and I think it is better to, to work out what the need is, uh, and then almost tender it so, um, and um, in the, 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 a lot of the Bill and Melinda Gates money was going I hope not just to reporters flying out from London with pith helmets but, but finding voices in Africa who could reflect Africa back to the rest of the world 
uh, and I think it's had some success in, in finding those voices. Vivian, any last thoughts on that or some other closing point you want to make? I'll, I'll, I will cede my time. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Craig, um, thoughts on what Eliza was saying about, um, you know, this, that philanthropy is not necessarily raising all boats. You've, of course, helped some groups that, like Julia, who are starting up a whole new thing. So that's not legacy. Um, but do you have any thoughts on that or other closing remarks? Uh, I'm a very small funder. I'm trying to use limited resources in my uh, sunset years to do the uh, most good towards contributing to a new normal. I'm only thinking a couple hundred years out, though. All right. Well, we'll have to think <laughs> about to what's going to be permanent beyond a couple hundred years. Um, please join me in thanking Craig and Vivian and Alan for sharing their wisdom and their insight. Thank you, and, <laughs> and thank you for coming. <laughs>